Well, so far, we've considered the following revelation that God gave in the Garden of Eden. We've seen that God revealed His plan and His purpose in the Garden of Eden. That through the creation of man and woman, God would fill the earth with His glory. Because we saw the word image speaks about God's character, as Paul interpreted that for us in the New Testament. And that likeness speaks about mental capacity, specifically spiritual discernment. And so God's intent from the beginning, he reveals, is that men and women would reflect his character and exercise spiritual discernment, and in so doing, when they had children, that they passed on the same qualities to, eventually the earth would be filled with God's glory. And we considered, as part of the revelation in the garden, that God revealed his memorial name in the context of having revealed his plan and purpose, that he would be manifest in a host, not just a host, but a host of mighty men and women, because he had promised that they would have dominion over his creation, dominion that was supposed to begin on the sixth day, uh, or sorry, on the seventh day, the day that God would rest. And we saw there God's desire for us to be involved in his work. And so in addition to learning about God's plan and purpose, we've also seen that this revelation that takes place in the garden also reveals for us information about God. He wants us to share in his work, which of course is incredibly humbling. When we think that God created all things and then rested on the seventh day and handed over, as it were, that creation to us. He wants us to be a part of his work. We saw that he desires to be a father to his creation. When we consider the journey of men and women who decide to reflect God's character and exercise spiritual discernment, fail though they may, in the end we saw that picture of those who had tried to elevate their thinking sitting beside Christ, riding white horses, and fighting against those systems which denied God's character, denied the special abilities that God had created all of mankind with. We also considered that they were given a special land yesterday, this territory of Eden, and within it a garden, a place that would be a covering, a place of protection for man and woman. We also considered then the revelation of the four rivers, that which was revealed to us, another vision into the future, the culmination of all things, that in the end we discover through these four rivers, we get insight to the fact that there was going to be a change, that there was going to be a period of time that men and women wouldn't reflect God's character. They would not strive after spiritual teaching. In fact, they would strive after the teaching of a nation that would come upon the earth to be called Babylon. And we know that nation was formed after the flood by Nimrod. And the picture that we were given, the revelation then that came from the four rivers, was that all creation will be groaning like a woman ready to give birth. And that birth will be the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the resurrection and immortalization of the saints who will subdue the armies of the nations, those that rebel against Christ's rulership and establish a new divine government. And we saw that at that time, a time that we long to be in, brothers and sisters, the nations will no longer flow to Babylon and its teachings, but will flow to Zion, to the teaching of God and Christ. And by God's grace, brothers and sisters, we can be a part of that glorious vision that is revealed in the garden a part of those who will teach the mortals on this earth, those that are preserved, not the beast that was destroyed, but the birds. We didn't read about it. We skipped over those passages in, Romans 9, in Revelation 19, but there was another class of people that was there watching the beast be destroyed. And the birds, the mortals that have the ability to be elevated in their thinking, who will flow to Zion to receive the teaching of God and of Christ 
through our mouths as well. And so we have such a beautiful vision painted for us in these studies back in the garden from the revelation that God gave at the beginning of his work with men and women. Now, after our class yesterday, um, Sister Dee McFarland gave me some homework, suggested it would have been very helpful to see where those four rivers were on the, on the map. So we made an attempt, of course, it's a guess because uh, it's only based on the, the uh, verses that we have. We know where Ethiop, the, uh, we know where the Euphrates is, we know where the Tigris is roughly today, although it seems that they flowed a different direction in that day. And then we're told that Gihon flowed toward the territory of Assyria and that Pison flowed all throughout the uh, Arabian territory, or as it was called then, Havilah. So perhaps the four rivers looked something like that, which is where we were able to then derive that the territory of Eden, this special land that God created in the beginning and then set a garden in, was the territory that flows from the Euphrates River, which is in Iran today, to the Mediterranean, encompassing Lebanon and Syria, all the way down to Egypt on the south, the southern Mediterranean side, and then encompassing all of what is Saudi Arabia, uh, Yemen, Amman, Qatar, and UAE today. So all of those nations were actually part of ancient Eden. Well, we'll continue then our exploration in Genesis chapter 2 of the revelation that God gave. We consider the memorial name that through the name generations, God was indicating a desire to have a relationship with us, to be a father to us and us to be his children. That he gave us dominion, and that dominion was centered in the garden which was placed eastward in Eden where the river went into four heads. Today, we'll consider that the tree of life was placed in the midst of the garden, and we'll see the introduction of this concept of free will. It's actually not a new concept because it ties back to those two qualities that God created man and woman with. The second quality was spiritual discernment. We saw that the the core, the root of that word, meant to make a choice. And when God puts trees in the garden and calls out two different trees, he tells Adam and Eve they've got to make a choice. They need to exercise that likeness of the Elohim. They need to exercise that spiritual discernment now. So let's just take a look then at the blessings that God gave in the garden. We considered on day one that God had a plan in Genesis 1 verse 26. He executed the plan in Genesis 1 verse 27. And then in Genesis 1 verse 28, he gave the first blessing, which was dominion over God's creation. And so we'll explore a little bit deeper then this word dominion and see how it's used in the rest of the Old Testament, the Hebrew word that's used here in the garden. We saw yesterday that there was a territory that they were blessed with, that God planted a garden before Eden. And we'll see today that God gave them access to eternal life. So these were the blessings of Eden, dominion, territory, and eternal life. Well, let's first explore dominion. The word appears in the Hebrew 22 times in the Old Testament, and we can see a donut graph on the screen there that talks about the different ways that that word is translated. But it's primarily used to describe two things in the Old Testament. As you go through and trace this word dominion, it almost always is used in the context of Solomon's reign on the one side, or prophetic of the saints ruling in the time period of the kingdom. And so this dominion which began on the seventh day, we considered in our first class, had a foreshadowing of dominion that would happen on the seventh day. And it's expounded for us in Hebrews chapter 4, where we're told that we ought to labor now that we might enter into that rest. And on the seventh day, the kingdom period, the period of the olam, the hidden period, 
We will not be sitting around playing harps as the vision of so many Christian churches around us. No, we'll be working and having dominion for one purpose, to bring all things into subjection to God, our Creator and our Heavenly Father. Well, let's look at three examples then of this word dominion in the Scriptures. The first one is in Psalm 72, verse 8, where it says that the King, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is both the King and the King's Son, it says in Psalm 72, will have dominion. It's the same word. Let's turn to Psalm 72, please. This is actually the last prayer of David. And if this is the last prayer of David, that would suggest it was one that he gave on his deathbed. And if we think of a faithful man who did so many things during his ministry, who was so thankful to God for the forgiveness that he showed where the law could not forgive, we think of a man who had a vision of a temple to be built, and not just a temple that his son would build, but a future temple that would be established, who had a vision of somebody that would sit on his throne in the future that would be the the son of God. And it's no surprise that Psalm 72 is all about the kingdom of God. And so the request is in verse 1, Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. See, Solomon was both king... And while David was alive, he was also the king's son. And so conveniently, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes to establish the kingdom on earth, will be the king, but he'll also be the king's son. Because like David recognized when he came to the throne, the throne is God's, and God permitted him to sit on the throne. And we read of the judgment of this king, of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we come down through verses 2 to 7. And then we read in verse 8, and he shall have dominion. There's the same word that we find in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 28. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. And we'll explore tomorrow how our Lord Jesus Christ intends to share that dominion with us. In Psalm 110, it says, The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. That's Christ, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. And we find out as we explore this concept further, it's not just the Lord Jesus Christ, but Yahweh there is Christ and the saints that rule in the midst of the enemies of God. And finally, in Joel chapter 3, when we read about the judgment of the nations, We have this key verse in Joel 3, verse 13. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. The wheat harvest is ripe. And this was the battle of Armageddon. We'll see this tomorrow night, God willing, in our session on Armageddon. And then it says, come, get you down. The same word for dominion in Genesis 1, 26 and 28. For the press is full and the fats overflow for their wickedness is great. So this word dominion is actually found between two parts and two different judgments in Joel chapter 3. The first half of the verse is talking about the the battle of Armageddon, the judgment of Gog, and the second part of the verse is actually talking about the judgment of the nations, which is fitting because Joel is a prophecy about the judgment of all nations. And the saints will be part of that dominion. And so we can see the future aspect of that blessing that God gave. The intent was that Adam and Eve would have that dominion right from the garden. That they would keep the garden. They would protect and take care of the garden. But unfortunately, it did not happen. Well, then we come back to the land. And we considered yesterday the territory of Eden and hinted perhaps where we might find the garden inside that land of Eden. We consider that Eden is a place of delights and pleasantness, and it's called paradise. So the definition of Eden is actually paradise. And we'll see how this place was on the mind of our Lord Jesus Christ in our class, God willing, tomorrow. Tomorrow. 
And the garden is a place that means to cover over and to shield from danger. Well, let's read back in Genesis chapter 2 about this garden that God plants at verse 8. Genesis 2 verse 8, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then we read about the four rivers yesterday. And so we'll skip down to verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it, to guard and protect and take care of that garden. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So here was this garden that God had planted. In Genesis chapter 13, when it talks about the valley of Sodom or the Jordan Valley being like the garden, it said it was well watered everywhere. And so that's a picture of what the garden was like. It was well watered everywhere. In Ezekiel, when we looked at references to the garden, it said that every kind of tree grew there. There were cedar trees, there were fir trees, and there were chestnut trees. When we looked at Isaiah 51 in Joel chapter 2, we saw that the garden is the very opposite of a desert or a burnt land. And then we see in Genesis chapter 2 that two special trees are placed in the midst of this garden. So where is the garden? We hinted at it yesterday, didn't we, as we explored those verses in Ezekiel that talked about the Garden of Eden. Well, consider what the theological word book says about this word Eden. The noun kedem has either a geographical meaning, that is east, or a temporal notion, the concept of time, ancient time or aforetime. The noun occurs 61 times. This is interesting. It puts this word in the same class as the word olam. It denotes an idyllic state, whereas olam denotes perpetuity, zaken, agedness, and risen primacy. And forgive my pronunciation of those Hebrew words if you speak Hebrew. So here's what the theological word book says, that equally this word can refer to being in front of, in terms of geography, which puts it at the east, or can be in front of, in terms of time. And so we could read that the, in the garden, that God planted a garden in front of Eden. That's the root word. Or God planted a garden idyllic in Eden. So although we've read eastward, and that is the reason then that so many commentaries and so many uh, Bible students have placed the Garden of Eden down at the base of the Euphrates and Tigris River, but actually when we explore the word, it doesn't need to mean eastward. It just means in front of. And if you're our Heavenly Father, and your view of the earth is the one that he's revealed in the scriptures... Well, what is the first place that God sees? What is the apple of God's eye? What is the land that is so special to God? What is the first thing that he sees? It's Jerusalem and the land of Israel. And so that's why we place the garden here with our little palm tree there on the west side, actually, in front of the first place that our Heavenly Father looks upon when he looks down upon the earth, the place that is special to him, the place that he desired to dwell in. Remember, when the children of Israel were standing on the other side of the Jordan River and Moses stood there telling them about the law, he was rather elusive about one big fact. He kept telling them, when you come into the land, you're going to have to take all your harvests and you're going to carry them forth into the place that I will choose. And when you get into the land, you're going to worship me in a place that I choose to dwell in. 
And all throughout the book of Deuteronomy, it talks about this place that God would choose. And you know, the judges came into the land after Joshua's conquest, and for 450 years, nobody desired to know the place that God would choose. And finally, when the kings came, the second king, the man after God's own heart, it tells us in Psalm 132, was losing sleep night after night because he desired so strongly to know where God wanted to place his name. And you know what God told him? God said in a vision, in a dream in the night, in answer to this man's prayers, because somebody wanted to get involved in God's work, he revealed that in Zion is where he wants to dwell. Just as we'll see today that God dwelled with Adam and Eve in the garden. Just as we're going to see, brothers and sisters, that God desires all of us to get back to the garden so that he can dwell with us, so that we can hear his voice walking in the garden amongst the trees in the cool of the day. God desires to dwell with us in this special land that he created. And so the passages we considered yesterday, Isaiah 51, the restoration of the Garden of Eden, and it's talking about the land of Israel, the land of Zion, that Zion will be like the Garden of the Lord. We believe actually Zion will be in the Garden of the Lord. We saw in Ezekiel 28 that the king of Tyre had been in the garden of God when he built the house of the Lord. Perhaps the strongest evidence we have in the scriptures outside of the theme we'll consider in this class of God's desire to dwell with man and where he has said he wants to dwell with man, the strongest evidence we have that the garden was along the coast of the Mediterranean in what is now Israel. And we alluded to this. That in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8, which we'll read now, Adam and Eve heard the voice of Yahweh Elohim walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And sadly, they hid themselves because of what had just previously transpired. But the picture then we're given is that God dwelt with Adam and Eve in the garden. And in fact, this becomes then A theme, does it not? When Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden, God doesn't stop then talking about his desire to dwell with his people. He says, I will dwell with the children of Israel in Exodus 29 at verse 45 through the tabernacle. It says in Psalm 68 that God went before his people in the wilderness, which first speaks of the pillar of cloud and of fire, for the children of Israel in the wilderness, but then speaks of God with the saints that will march from Sinai to Zion when the kingdom is being established. God went before his people. We already considered Psalm 132 at verse 13. Yahweh had chosen Zion to place his name there. He desired it to be his habitation. And we read that the Lord dwells in those who are poor and of a contrite spirit and that trembles at my word. Again, God's desire to dwell with man. It's there in the law. It's there in the Psalms. It's there in the prophets. God wants to dwell with us, brothers and sisters. And that's both humbling and exciting but also probably a little bit nerve-wracking. Would we be comfortable letting God into our home? Would we be comfortable, and of course he's already there because he sees everything, whether it's in the deep or the highest heaven, he sees everything. But think about it now personally, perhaps thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Would we be comfortable with him dwelling with us in our office while we work, at school while we attend university, while we're out in the neighborhood shopping, 
Would we be comfortable with him dwelling in our home and seeing what goes on there? It places a responsibility on us, doesn't it, brothers and sisters? And how humbling is it? You know, Micah tells us to humble ourselves to walk with God. But God wants to walk with us. God wants to dwell with us. The God who created all things. Which is why the psalmist in Psalm 8 was so overwhelmed when he looked up and saw the stars. He said, what is man? What is man? And God desires to dwell with us. We saw in Isaiah 66 that God doesn't want to desire in temples that are made with hands. It's almost like Isaiah is answering David's request back in 2 Samuel 7. When David said, I want to build a temple where God can dwell. And Isaiah says, God doesn't really want to dwell in buildings. Where God wants to dwell is in the hearts of people. He wants to dwell in our lives. He wants to dwell with us. And what type of people? Why those type of people that reflect his character. And when we reflect his character, we are poor and of a contrite spirit because we're self-reflective. And being self-reflective, we realize how often we don't reflect God's character and how often we fail in exercising spiritual discernment. And consequently, when we're honest with ourselves, it creates in us a poor and a contrite spirit. There's no room for pride when we're honest with ourselves, about ourselves. And God wants to dwell with us when we have that spirit, poor and contrite and trembling at his word. Paul picks this up in the New Testament, doesn't he? And says, ye are the temple of the living God. God always intended to dwell in us and to be a father to us. And then when we come to future Bible prophecies, we see a picture of the kingdom in Joel 3. I am Yahweh, your Elohim, dwelling in where? In Zion, in the location of the Garden of Eden, restored at that time. The tabernacle of God is with men. We read at the end of the apocalypse, and he will dwell with them. And with Eden restored in that day, once again, God will dwell with all men and all women as he intended in the garden. And you know, we're going to see in a few minutes that even when God expelled Adam and Eve from the garden, the very thing that he established to guard and to protect the garden actually spoke of God's desire to get us back into the garden so that we could dwell with us. Well, we come then to the choice that God put before Adam and Eve, the third blessing, the opportunity to have eternal life. I mean, we talk about God giving us the benefit of the doubt. Adam and Eve were not immortal, of course, at this point, were they? They were not exactly mortal in the way we are. They could die, but they weren't dying creatures because that happened after Adam and Eve transgressed. And yet here they are in the garden before they've made any decision with the capabilities that God has given them and God's already blessed them with dominion and he's already placed them into the special land and he's already given them access to eternal life with the tree of life that was put there. Out of the ground, God made the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden. God didn't hide the tree of life. He put it in the middle of the garden and he put another tree there, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God gave a commandment, didn't he, at verse 16 of Genesis 2 as we read. You can freely eat of every tree of the garden. And by the way, one of those trees will give you access to eternal life. You can freely eat of any tree in the garden, including the tree of life. But just don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt start dying. Dying thou shalt die. 
a process leading to an ultimate conclusion. And that's how we know that Adam and Eve were not yet mortal in the sense that we are, because they were not yet dying with the conclusion of death. This was something that would change in them after the transgression. So they were given an access to the tree of knowledge, and they were told that that tree would bring death. And so God was now going to exercise the spiritual discernment that he had blessed us with, the likeness of the Elohim. He says, I want you to use your mental capacity now to choose between what? Between life and death. The choice has always been the same, brothers and sisters. It was the same on the the banks of the Jordan River when Moses stood there. He said, look, there's two choices you have when you cross over into the land. You can worship God and be thankful for what he's giving you, when you cross the river and enter the kingdom of God, or you can go against him and worship idols and worship this world and choose death. And it was the same choice for Adam and Eve. You can choose life, any tree, including the tree of life, or death. Sadly, Adam and Eve chose death, which we'll consider in a few minutes. Well, we've considered then the three blessings that God bestowed upon Adam and Eve and intended to bestow upon all of the human race. Dominion over creation, a special land, and access to the tree of life. We've got a table there partially filled out that we'll continue to fill out through the remainder of our classes, God willing. We're going to pause from that and just consider, as the record pauses from this theme And consider then the creation, just briefly, of male and female. So we see that God says at verse 18, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a help suitable for him. A companion that is suitable for him. One that could help him with the blessings that God had given. One that could help him with dominion. One that would be needful to fill the earth with children that would reflect God's character and exercise spiritual discernment. One that was not only necessary physically and biologically, but one that was necessary also because she would be the primary teacher of those children while the husband was tending, keeping the ground and attending to those other matters. And we saw that in the context of God's plan and purpose with the earth, to fill the earth with his glory, and for men and women to have dominion over it, male and female are presented as one, which is picked up by the Apostle Paul in Galatians 3, verse 28. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. But in Genesis chapter 2, the creation of male and female are separated. Now we commented, didn't we, that God presents himself in the scriptures with both male and female qualities. And outside of male and female being one in Christ Jesus, we see that God put an institution in place in Genesis chapter 2, whereby first and foremost, the man would appreciate that which God had given him as a gift, the woman that was a help and a companion suitable for him, but that they would then work on developing each other's character. Being alone, our character doesn't develop. And so we're put together, husband and wife, we're put together in ecclesias so that we can develop each other's characters. And so we read in Genesis chapter 2 that a bride was taken from the side of Adam and God caused a deep sleep to fall upon him in verse 21. And while he slept, God took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof. And out of the rib of man, he created woman. This is now a creation that is completely different than anything else that was created. We saw that male and female were created differently back in chapter 1, verse 26. Instead of it just being a command, as we considered in our exhortation, it was instead a discussion that took place, a plan, a vision of what it would be like with men and women on the earth and the execution of that plan. And now, as we break down further details, we find out that the man was created first and that then secondly, the woman was taken out of his side to demonstrate that these two would be 
complementary to each other. And not only so, but do you know, brothers and sisters, where that word rib then later appears in the scriptures? It, pardon? In the tabernacle, absolutely. It's the word used to describe the walls of the tabernacle in the wilderness. It's the word used to describe the sides of the Ark of the Covenant. It's the word used to describe the altar. It's the word used to describe the sides or the walls of Solomon's temple. It's the word used to describe the walls of Ezekiel's temple. The word rib that's found here in in Genesis chapter 2. And what do all of those things have in common? The altar, the ark, the tabernacle, the temple that Solomon built, the temple of the future. Well, we already considered those passages. It was the place where God would choose to dwell with his people. And now we have another picture that out of the side of Adam is taken a bride. And that bride, that symbol, that rib that she was formed from is then transported through the rest of the scriptures and identified as a place where God will dwell. The same theme that we saw there from Genesis 3 verse 8. They heard the voice of Yahweh Elohim walking in the garden amongst the trees in the cool of the day. God desires to dwell with his people. And so the woman we get to see already in this becomes then to symbolize the place where God dwells, to symbolize the ecclesia. And when we compare this bride that was taken from Adam's side to another man in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ, we see that from his side as well, a bride was taken. With Adam, he was put into a deep sleep, and from his side... God created a bride. And the Lord Jesus Christ was also put into a deep sleep, that is, put to death for three days. And when our Lord died on the cross, it says in the Gospel of John that one of the soldiers reached up with a spear and shoved it into his side to put him to death in case he was still alive because they needed to be dead and down before the Sabbath, before the Passover began. And it says in John's gospel that from his side flowed blood and water. And from which a bride was formed. Unfortunately, the bride of Adam grasped after equality with God, we'll read shortly. But our Lord Jesus Christ's example is that we ought not to grasp after equality with God. And Christ did not grasp after equality with God as Adam with his wife had done. Adam sinned against God, introducing the need for sacrifice. Not only did our Lord Jesus Christ not sin, but he became the sacrifice as a sin offering and opened the way for our nature to be changed by providing forgiveness of sin. We saw that because of we see that because of what Adam and Eve did in their transgression, human nature and mortality pass on to all of their progeny. And they're cast out of the garden, which was then guarded. Whereas our Lord Jesus Christ in his sacrifice opened the way to the tree of life in the garden. And so we have a picture then as well of a bride coming out of the side of the Son of God. Pointing forward to that future bride that we all hope to be a part of, brothers and sisters. That we will joy to experience because we have chosen to associate ourselves with his blood and through water. And so when we look at male and female in Genesis chapter 2, we have an expansion. Although in the plan and purpose of God with the earth, male and female are presented as one, in the dominion that they have in the kingdom, they will share that dominion together. But God established a divine order in Genesis chapter 2 and said there's a greater responsibility that the man has for the woman, recognizing she was formed out of his very side, just as Paul expounds in Ephesians. Our Lord Jesus Christ has the greater care for his bride and the greater responsibility because he was the one who had to lay down his life for her. 
But Paul says, in any case, in the Lord, the woman is not independent of the man, nor is the man independent of the woman. For just as woman came from man, so man comes through woman. But all things come from God. And so we're given a divine order, God supreme, then Adam, and then she who was created to be a compatible and a suitable companion to him to help him fill the earth with the people that would reflect God's character and exercise spiritual discernment. And in so doing, they would share together in the time period of the kingdom dominion over all that God created. Sadly, we know the story. There's no surprise. We're not spoiling anything here by alluding to the fact that Adam and Eve transgressed. They were created with the ability to reflect God's character, to exercise spiritual discernment in making godly choices, but they desired more. This serpent who was amoral, as we considered on Monday, who wasn't making moral decisions, just logical ones, he pointed out that this tree could elevate them to be like the Elohim. And Eve looked on it and saw that it was a tree to be desired to make one wise, and she grasped after equality with God. And once they had transgressed, something changed in their mind. You know, the funny thing is, they already had knowledge of good, did they not? How do we know that? Well, because God said at the end of the sixth day, he looked on everything he had made and it was good. And then at the end of the sixth day, he looked on everything that he had made across all six days and it was very good. Did they have knowledge of good? He placed them in a garden that was well watered and filled with trees. He gave them access to eternal life. Did they have knowledge of good? Well, certainly they did. They dwelled with God in the garden, the voice of the Lord walked in the midst of the garden in the cool of the day. They already had knowledge of good. What did they not have? The knowledge of evil. And I don't think, brothers and sisters, there was anything magical about that tree of knowledge of good and evil. They already had the knowledge of the good. And the evil was transgression against God's commandment. And once they transgressed, their eyes were opened, it says in Genesis chapter 3 at verse 7, and they knew that they were naked. Something happened in the brain. Actually, scientists know now what happened in the brain because when we do something that brings us pleasure or that we think is going to bring us pleasure, the brain actually carves new neural pathways. It actually establishes new synopses to make it easier to make that same decision again. Now think about that in terms of transgression. So once we transgress, the brain actually creates new neural pathways to make it easier to transgress again. What's the fundamental lesson from that? Well, if we don't do it the first time, it'll be easier not to do it the second time. And we might think to ourselves, well, does that mean that we've been set up for failure in some sense. Because when we sin, it's easier to sin the next time. Actually, it's believed that the reason our brain was created this, even by people that don't believe in God, the reason our brain was created this way was because if we were gathering food in a forest, which is how they would have gone to buy their berries in Adam's day, not at Walmart or a grocery store, those neural pathways that are created help you remember how to get back to that berry bush that you found in the Garden of Eden so that it's infused in your brain. I can now get back to the berries. I can now get back to the pineapple or the coconut or the banana. So that's why our brain was created that way, to make it easier to get to those things that derive pleasure. And not all things that derive pleasure are evil, We're told of things that we're able to enjoy, aren't we? We're able to enjoy food. We're able to enjoy and rejoice in the fruit of our labor, in the wife of our youth, our marriage. We're told to enjoy. So there are many things that the brain will carve neural pathways to make it more enjoyable to be with our spouse, to make it more enjoyable to eat. But the same 
way that our brains were created also makes it easier for us to sin the second time. And when we do it the second time, those neural pathways get stronger, and it's easier the third time. And then by the time we do it the 20th time, we've got a carved pathway in our brain. And so what happened when Adam and Eve transgressed is some new synopses started to fire in their brain. See, their transgression resulted in what we call human nature, the propensity we have now to sin. It's their fault. We know that because in James chapter 2, it says that God makes no man sin. So if God was the one who had changed the way the brain was working after their transgression to now make Adam and Eve and all of creation prone to sin, well, James wouldn't have been able to write that God makes no man sin. It was the sin itself in Adam and Eve that changed the way the brain was wired, and that got passed on to all of their progeny. But a second change took place in their bodies the moment they sinned, and that had to do with a commandment that God had made. In the day that thou eatest thereof, dying thou shalt die. And we don't know what it was that he did. But he reached inside their bodies, Adam and Eve, and he he changed perhaps the DNA or maybe the RNA that recreates the DNA because they've discovered that every generation has twice the number of defects in their body than the previous generation had. And so perhaps, and that's because of the way the body reproduces DNA. It reproduces it with Errors. It's like having a photocopy machine with a blotch on it. Except the next generation comes along and there's two blotches. And the next generation comes along and there's four blotches on the photocopy. And as you get further and further away from Adam and Eve, you get further and further away from a pure gene pool they've discovered. And we have more and more errors in our body, which results in cancer and all sorts of other diseases that we have. We don't know. We can only surmise. But God did something on that day to change them to being dying creatures. They were not immortal before. They could die. And immortal means can't die. They could die. But when Adam and Eve transgressed, God flipped a switch. And our bodies became the corruptible bodies they are now. And when Adam and Eve transgressed, they created new neural pathways in the brain that were, trans- that were then passed on to all future generations. And so then we inherit from Adam what? Well, we inherit from Adam those neural pathways that are called a propensity to sin or sin in the flesh or serpent-like thinking. The war that Paul tells us about in Romans chapter 7, we inherited that from them. And also upon their transgression, God flipped that switch and they started corrupting. And we inherit that from Adam and Eve. And when Adam and Eve transgressed, not only did these two things happen, but the angels and God had a counsel at verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil, And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. It was actually quite merciful, wasn't it, brothers and sisters? Because I know that one of the things that I long for in that day is to be shed of those propensities to sin that I inherited from Adam and Eve. Can you imagine if we live forever with those propensities to sin, that would be misery. And so the access to the tree of life was removed. 
And in order to remove them from the tree of life, which was there in the midst of the garden, well, they were sent forth from the Garden of Eden. And we don't discover this here, but over in Genesis chapter 9, we find out that the relationship between man and animal had actually changed. Turn over a couple of pages to Genesis chapter 9 and verses 1 and 2. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. There's the commandment of Genesis 1 verse 28. And what's the context of that commandment? Fill the earth with children that reflect my character and that will exercise spiritual discernment. And now, instead of saying, and have dominion over the earth, he says, and the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of air of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. And so we discover that the third blessing was also removed upon their transgression. They had been given dominion. The dominion is removed. They had been given a special land. The special land is removed. They had been given access to eternal life. And access to eternal life is removed. But we'll see tomorrow, brothers and sisters. So great is the mercy of our God. That before he cast them out of the garden, he already reveals to them how they can gain access to that tree of life once again. We conclude our chapter then with this vision of these cherubim set up at the end, the Easter, in front of the Garden of Eden, a flaming sword which turns every way to keep the way of the tree of life. You know, that word keep is the same word that was found earlier in Genesis chapter 2 when it says that he gave man, he put man in the garden to keep and to tend to the garden. And so because man had failed in doing what God had commanded him, God instead placed an angel to do what Adam was supposed to have done. Whereas Adam was to keep, watch, observe, to have charge over, to guard and protect the garden, he now places this responsibility in the hand of the cherubim. To keep, to guard, to protect, to watch over, and to observe the way to the tree of life. But this wasn't to actually keep them away from the tree of life. It was to preserve the way back to the tree of life. And do you know how the cherubim are then used throughout the rest of the scriptures? Well, in Genesis 3, verse 24, it speaks of keeping the way to the tree of life. But we find the cherubim again in Exodus chapter 25, verse 30, on top of the mercy seat on the ark, which is placed in the most holy place between which... God's glory, the light, shines. In Numbers 7, verse 89, it says that the voice of the Lord comes from between those cherubim that were on top of the ark, on top of the mercy seat. In all these passages, 2 Samuel 6, verse 2, 19, 1 2 Kings 19, 15, Psalm 80, verse 1, and Isaiah 37, verse 6, it speaks about Yahweh of armies dwelling in the cherubim. So even the cherubim that were placed there to guard the way to the tree of life when they were cast out was only a reminder that the presence of Yahweh is there and that he desires to dwell with his people. And so he put those cherubim in the midst of the encampment of the ecclesia to remind them of his desire that was expressed at the beginning to dwell. Furthermore, when we look at the tabernacle... Not only was God's glory there in the midst of the cherubim over the mercy seat in the most holy place, which only the priests saw once per year, but actually there were cherubim on the outer gate of the tabernacle, weren't they, sewn into it, showing them why the way to God's presence. And once you open the outer gate of the outer court, you then saw another set of veils that was there, another gate that was there of cloth, and on those gates was again the cherubim 
demonstrating you had to go a little further to get to the presence of Yahweh. And when you opened up those on the holy place, there was yet another set of curtains in front of the most holy place with what? Why cherubim on them, showing the way to the presence of God had now been appointed through this cherubim that sat on the mercy seat that was in the most holy in the midst of the camp of Israel. And the same pattern was kept on the walls and the doors of Solomon's temple. And the same pattern is there described on the walls of Ezekiel's temple. Except it's only two of the faces of the cherubim, the man and the lion. And then, of course, we see in Ezekiel and in Revelation, the cherubim are described as living creatures with four faces. And what's the symbolism of the cherubim? That God desires to dwell with men. And in that day, throughout the book of Revelation, we see the cherubim there because now God is dwelling with those that spend a lifetime trying to reflect his character and exercise spiritual discernment. And so we've expanded our understanding of the revelation in the garden. That in addition to God filling the earth with his glory, then the addition of the manifestation of his name, Yahweh Elohim, he gave them dominion and a special land and he had also given them access to eternal life. That was part of God's plan from the beginning revealed in the garden. And about God, we learn an additional thing that God desires to dwell with us. Did you know what we haven't learned yet? when we consider the revelation of the garden so far, outside of God's desire to share his work with us and be a father to us and to dwell with us, what's the major thing that's missing? The character of God is not yet revealed, which will be the subject of our class tomorrow when transgression has now entered into the world. 